Excuse me. Okay, so I hope that you see what I see. So hopefully you'll, you'll see me and hear me fine, just like you did until now. And you also see the, the slide. So uh, welcome Americans to uh, our first Hungarian wine one-on-one -on -one virtual tour and tasting. Uh, I'm Gábor Bánfalvi, one of the owners of uh, Taste Hungary and uh, uh, the tasting table. Uh, I am sitting in our wine shop in, in Budapest and uh, I will introduce a little bit our company and then I will introduce and talk about Hungarian wine, Hungarian wine history, uh, the different regions, different grape varieties, and uh, we will taste these wines uh, uh, together. So uh, I'm sitting in our wine shop. This, this is in Budapest, uh, very near the National Museum. I know some of you have been here, uh, but I'm sure not all of you. Uh, this on the photo is our wine tasting cellar. Uh, we do a lot of wine tastings, wine dinners, and uh, we took a big break because of COVID, but uh, we're slowly back on the road now. And we also do different wine tours, uh, walks in Budapest, and uh, we, are also, we import wine to the US as well. That's how we were able to make this happen, that uh, from multiple states, you guys are all enjoying a glass of Hungarian wine. So thank you so much for joining and your interest in Hungarian wine. Cheers, Egeshega Drap. And uh, this is, now this is of the official menu for tonight. Egri Chillag, the first Eger White, uh, dry Furmin from Tokaj, Olas Rizling from Shomlo, Choka Sule from the Zala region, that's the first red, Egri Bikavir, Bozblak from Eger, second red, and then we will have a sweet wine, uh, sweet Samorodni from the Tokai region. Highlight, great to see you again. <clears throat> so um, let's start um, with a bit of geography. Uh, I am sitting right here in the middle of Budapest and uh, Hungary is a country of about 10 million people and uh, more than a quarter live in Budapest, in the capital. So it's a, bit, it's a bit uneven in terms of the population. The capital is huge. Hungarians call it the, the water head. And uh, uh, I look at Hungary as, you know, Budapest, and then the rest is actually just vineyards of Budapest. Uh, and uh, officially, uh, of course, nobody would agree with me on that. And officially there are 22 different wine regions in Hungary. Hungarians take this regional approach to wine uh, very seriously. And that's how we ended up with two uh, different uh, uh, wine regions. Each have their own wine making board. They each have their own uh, quality control and, uh, and uh, wine board and, and so on and so on. Uh, today we will taste wine from one, two, three, four, five, no, sorry, four different regions. Uh, we will start with the with the Eger region in the north eastern part of the country. And uh, just a little photo of Budapest. You know, I think Hungary is really a prime uh, wine and food destination. Uh, you can enjoy and actually drive to any of the wine regions from Budapest in a couple of hours, three hours is the most, and even do a day trip and return to uh, your hotel in Budapest and enjoy the city. And there are not that many wine regions that are so so approachable like this. And um, there's good food, unique varietals, flavors. So I, I think it's a pretty, pretty nice uh, setup. And uh, while you are enjoying this wine, I will talk about this guy. But while you're enjoying the first sips, uh, and you can even move on to the second or third wine. You know, you can, you can pace yourself. We are so far away from each other. Uh, you know, it, it's totally fine how you, 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 you do it. Uh, I will talk about history a little bit because um, one of the very special things about um, Hungarian wine, and that's become part of the, you know, the terroir, is, is history. So Hungary is one of the oldest uh, 
or one of the older winemaking countries, it uh, is sort of a forgotten, uh, or it was forgotten for, for many decades because of um, uh, how the 20th century turned out. But um, we've been, people have been making wine here for two, two and a half thousand years, started by the Celts and then continued by the Romans, like in many, many parts of Europe. So, you know, this, this, this is very old. And then Hungarian tribes came here in the late, uh, uh, or yeah, in the late 800s. So 896 is the official date when Hungarian uh, settled here. And supposedly it was already a wine drinking nation. It was not a wine making nation because we were nomadic but uh, supposedly we were drinking wine already. Our word for wine is bor, B-O-R, which is not related to any European uh, word for wine, like vino or wine. Uh, it's, it's, it's an ancient word, so that probably indicates that we were in contact with wine before we settled and mixed with European nations. And uh, our first king, Saint Stephen, uh, took Christianity, made Christianity the official, uh, uh, religion of Hungary and along with that uh, wine drinking uh, and wine making became very important to Hungarians. A bunch of uh, French and Italian German monks came here and they brought their wine making and wine uh, uh, yeah, wine making skills uh, with them. So one of the sources of Hungarian wine making ancient sources is these uh, Benedictine and uh, uh, well, Christian uh, different orders that came here. And uh, Hungarian wine making was flourishing during the medieval times. Uh, wine, gold, and salt were the three main exports of uh, Hungary for centuries. And uh, we were selling, uh, uh, yeah, we, we had gold mines, we had salt mines, and we were making wine. That was, that was how the economy was, uh, was uh, doing pretty well. And this ended with the, uh, in the 1500s when the Ottoman Turks uh, invaded Hungary and the Balkans and uh, uh, winemaking suffered greatly from the wars and the different battles. And uh, there was a pause of quality winemaking or, uh, for, for about two, two and a half centuries. And um, winemaking, became a big thing again when the Habsburgs took over Hungary in the, in, the, in the late 1600s and a bunch of German settlers came here and that was the new, that was the new uh, beginning, I would say, the, the, the first rebirth of, of winemaking here. And that renaissance lasted all the way until uh, the late 1800s when the phylloxera uh, happened. Phylloxera is a root bug that uh, killed most of Europe's uh, vines. Hungary was no exception, so that was a huge shock. And um, we recovered from that, but then unfortunately World War I, World War II happened. Hungary was uh, not exactly on the right side on either one. And, uh, you know, the Austro-Hungarian monarchy broke up in 1920, 1920, yeah. And then World War II happened, the Holocaust happened, and, uh, and, and, uh, you know, all these traumas badly affected uh, the wine, the wine culture and wine making here. Uh, a lot of the wine traders were Jewish and, uh, you know, they, they perished in the Holocaust. And then soon after World War II was over, communism started. Communism here lasted 45 years and uh, quality wine making was non-existent uh, during that time. Uh, and when I became a young drinker, in uh, uh, late high school in the early 1990s. That's when communism fell. And uh, that was the, I would say, the third or maybe the fourth renaissance of Hungarian wine in the course of a thousand years. <clears throat> and uh, in my you know, lifetime, the past 30 years, uh, winemaking just, and well, the country itself too, went through an incredible change. Uh, and I think winemaking is one of the bigger successes that. Uh, uh, democratic Hungary can show, you know, uh, how families again are making wine, how family labels are, are, uh, you know, all over the place again, and how quality driven winemaking took over uh, the communist uh, approach to the winemaking. 
So this is where we're standing now. And, um, and uh, some more uh, figures about Hungarian winemaking. Uh, I wanted to make this class a bit more informative than I usually do on, on some of my other tastings. Uh, so we cover, we have about 60, 65,000 hectares of vineyards that makes us uh, the 17th largest producer in the world and the seventh largest producer in Europe. And uh, from this 700 or 600, uh, sorry, 60,000 uh, hectares of vineyards, we produce 400 million uh, liters of wine. Two thirds of it is quality wine, which is a nice uh, average. And uh, two thirds of it is white, as opposed to one third, which is red. And we export a lot, more than most people think, more than what I used to think until I looked into it a little more seriously. We actually export 37% of our production, but most of it is bulk wine sold to uh, uh, the neighboring countries, Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Germany. And only a little bit of the quality wine is exported. And we are one of the exporters within the EU and, uh, and, and to the US as well. The um, per capita consumption here is over 20 liters, which is twice the per capita consumption of the United States. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, but only the half of how much French people drink. French people drink more than 40 liters of wine a year. And uh, uh, I'm sure I'm much closer to that than the Hungarian average. So cheers to that. Let's, let's, let's uh, raise the per capita uh, wine consumption today, both in Hungary and the United States. And um, I'll talk about the grape varieties a little bit. First, the white. Uh, the number one grape variety in Hungary is the number one white grape, most common Hungarian grape, is called Bianca. I was also shocked to hear that because I, I never had wine from that. Um, it's an aromatic varietal grown in the Great Plain, and it's probably turned into bulk wine uh, more than anything. Then the second most important or most common is Cersegi Fuseres, which is again an aromatic grape. Uh, we have it here in the shop. It's a good, easy drinking, uh, very perfumey wine, but about 5% of our production that is, is that. And then the first most interesting one the, uh, is Furmint. Uh, that's finally not an aromatic grape. Uh, that is um, the second wine that we are going to have today, Furmint. Uh, most important variety in Tokai, but also important in other parts of, of Hungary. And its popularity is, is, is increasing uh, Thank God, I love, I love food, I'm a huge fan. So I hope soon it's gonna take over the other two. Uh, and uh, yeah, 5% of our, of our vineyards are forming. Then comes Olas Riesling. We're gonna have an Olas Riesling today as well. I'll talk about the grape uh, when we get there. And uh, I listed a few more uh, native varietals here just for interest, Hash Levelu, Ufark, uh, you, some of you might have heard of these. Uh, they, are, they are great varieties, but uh, we're not going to taste uh, these today or not uh, as a single varietal. And of course, we have uh, international white grapes as well, like uh, Yellow Muscat, Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, which we call Surke Barat, and a lot more. We have hundreds of varietals, so this is really just a few. Uh, from the reds that are less common, only 30%, uh, the number one grape is Cake Frankosch. I'm sure you heard of that. And the other two that are very important, local grapes, are off, offsprings of Cake Frankosch. One of them is Zweiger, the other is Portugieser. And I listed here Kadarka and Choka uh, We will taste actually all of these, some as a single varietal, others as you know, part of a blend. And uh, from the international red grapes, Cabernet Franc is very, very important. I think the better, the best uh, full-bodied reds in Hungary are made from Cabernet Franc. And the south of the country, Villain, is really building a reputation for, for it and uh, making it, having its own signature style. Nice, spicy, full-bodied reds are, are, 
are made from it. And uh, of course, we grow Cabernet Sauvignon as well, Merlot, Pinot Noir, Syrahs, and there is a long list. Uh, but, uh, you know, these are grapes that are grown pretty much anywhere. So um, it's, um, it's uh, not that unique to Hungary. And um, so now let's uh, talk about, no, I'm closed, sorry. Sorry guys, somebody wanted to buy wine. Uh, so uh, let's talk about the Eger region first, where, uh, where the first white is coming. Eger is a, is a land of, uh, of blends. So blending different wines and grapes uh, go back uh, uh, many, many decades, uh, more than a hundred years at least. Uh, Eger is, is a very northern region in the northeastern uh, part of, of Hungary. It's a volcanic region with uh, rhyolite tough stone, just like in Tokai. And um, the flagship red, red blend is the Bikavir. We're going to taste that, the bull's blood. And bull's blood has a white sister called Egri Chillag, which is what you are having now from the Böjt uh, family. Uh, Eger is a 50% red, 50% white region, and from the reds, Cake Frankos is the king, but there are 12 other uh, grapes, international and Hungarian, that can be grown there. So altogether 13 reds, and probably that many whites are, are grown there. And uh, from the whites, Olaf Riesling, Kirailanka, and Chardonnay are, are, are very important. Just a sec, somebody... Uh, wants to uh, check in and join us now. Um, done. So let's talk about the, the Agri Chillag blend. Now we finally got to the wines after this long introduction. So let's talk about this white blend, uh, what makes it special and where the name comes from. So the, the first, uh, this, the star of Eger, Eger Chillag is a, is a fantasy name, uh, a brand name that uh, people came up with in 2010. Uh, that, that's when the, they first released this, this white blend based or motivated, inspired by the popularity of, of the red blend, the Bulls Blood blend. The name, which I'm not very happy about, uh, Star of Eger, at least in English, doesn't sound that catchy to me. Uh, the name goes back to the Turkish times when roads were lit uh, by these um, guard towers and uh, uh, these guard towers were lit by torches and the locals called that, you know, the Eger stars uh, that were shining in, in, in the night. Uh, at least this is the, the, the story that I heard. And, uh, and the, the Chillag blend always has to be made from at least Hungarian, four Hungarian grape varieties. They have to make up at least 50% of the blend. So these grape varieties could be Olas, Rizling, Hash, Tevelu, Leainka, Kirai, Leainka, and a couple of more. But either way, uh, they have to be local indigenous varieties making up at least 50% of the blend. Each one has to be in the blend at least 5%. And, uh, and if you want to make an easy drinking uh, uh, chillag, then 30% of these, of the grapes can be aromatic. So perfumey grapes like yellow muscat or from the Hungarian side, kirai And uh, there are three quality levels. Uh, you are drinking the, um, uh, let me see, did I put? Yes, yeah, superior quality, so the medium quality. Uh, usually the classic one is, is very aromatic, very easy drinking. Uh, this one is a little heavier than that. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I didn't mention international grapes can also go in this, in this blend. Then that includes Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Gris, Viognier, and a few more. So this one, the Böjt, uh, take on the Chillag includes Olas Riesling, Leainka, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, and uh, Yellow Muscat. 
And the, the, from the Sauvignon Blanc, you definitely get a little bit of grassiness. And from the uh, Yellow Muscat, you get a nice aroma. So both are, are very important to it, while the Hungarian varieties are less, less pronounced on, on the nose. And um, for, the, for the Grand Superior, there's barrel aging required as well. For the Superior, there is no requirement for that. Uh, just a lower yield uh, in the vineyard than for the passing one. So enjoy it. Uh, and uh, with that, I am going to move on to the Tokai region and the, um, and the, and the Furmi. Do you all have the bottle? I hope. You either have a, a bottle from the Kwasinga winery or from the Ajivet winery. Uh, both of them are single uh, varietal furmings. And uh, I, put the, I put the wine list in the, in the chat box in case you, you have to look. And right now I'm showing you a, an old map of uh, the Tokai region. Tokai is uh, even further north and further east than the Eger region, but they are almost neighboring from you know, where the previous wine came from. And uh, it's a relatively large region, maybe 70 kilometer long, uh, going like this northern tip uh, reaches over to Slovakia now. And there are a couple of villages there that are part of the region and that can use the name. And in the Hungarian side, there are 28 villages and cities that can use the Tokai name and th that are part of this region. Uh, it's a volcanic terroir, uh, as you see on these rocks. Uh, these are all volcanic uh, 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 rhyolite tough stones. Uh, in this case, they are coming from the, the village of Mad, uh, where these stones are mixed with uh, iron and um, that makes them red. So um, uh, it's a very volcanic region with more than 400 volcanoes, extinct uh, volcanoes there. And uh, it's an exclusively white wine region. Six grape varieties are, are allowed, which I will talk uh, about later. And uh, Tokai has a unique uh, climate with two rivers located uh, right there, the Tisa and the Bodrog rivers. So from those rivers, you get a nice humidity in the fall which is very important for making the sweet wine. From the cold, you get, well, I mean, from the north, from Poland and Slovakia, you get this cold breeze uh, that uh, is more or less uh, tamed by the hills, uh, the northern hillsides. And then from the south of, the, uh, of Hungary, the Great Plain area, you get uh, a very warm, very hot uh, climate. So it's, it's at the intersection of cultures, soil varieties, climates, and um, it, it makes it a very exciting region. If you visit it, I'm, I'm sure you remember. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its history, for the, the cellars that are built there, and for the fact that, you know, the recipe we've been using was already recorded for, for the sweet wine, was recorded in 1571. So we've been using the same recipe at least for that long. And uh, that's, that's almost 500 years. And that's a lot uh, for anything, uh, including uh, you know, the recipe for this uh, sweet wine that we are going to taste. It's also one of the first delimited, so closed wine regions of, uh, of the world. Uh, it was uh, uh, determined by the King of Hungary in 1737 which villages are part of the region, what grapes can be grown, and so on and so on. All of these, uh, it was one of the first wine laws of, uh, of the world. Uh, port, so Port in, um, in Portugal, Chianti in Italy, and, and Tokai are the first three uh, delimited wine regions of the world. The grape varieties in Tokai are Furmint, which is what you're having right now, Ashlebelu, uh, uh, which we're not having today. There is yellow muscat, which we're not having today either. These take up for most of, almost uh, you know, 95% of the production. And there are three um, 
minor varieties, there's zeta, faber, and fövérszőlő. And if you look at this slide, you can get the idea of what Topa is about. These, it, it, it's just incredible uh, landscape. Uh, and they use these little cellars were also hand carved into the hillside and uh, they were built from the most typical uh, soil type of the region, the, the rhyolite tough stone, which is a porous stone, but it's hard enough to, it, it holds, you know, a wine cellar without uh, bricks or columns and lining, uh, and they can use the, these limes, uh, these, uh, these rhyolite uh, bricks for the cellars, for, for the facade, and also for, for buildings, of course. Furmint, uh, the grape you're having right now from, uh, from Tokai, is a late ripening variety. Please taste it, uh, go for it. It's a late ripening variety. It has a high acidity, as you can probably tell. And uh, it has a thick skin, which I don't think you can tell just by drinking the wine. And due to this uh, thick skin, uh, it has high tannins because tannins, this dryness, comes from the, the skin or the seed of the berries, better from the skin. And it has a neutral character, which uh, is great actually, because it doesn't overwhelm the structure, the complexity of the soil uh, that it comes from. So it's sort of ideal for Tokai. Tokai is already so, has such a strong character. The wines that come from there, almost anything can, you know, such strong, per strong personality that if you put in a stronger varietal, then it's just gonna be too much. Uh, they, will, they will almost kill each other. But since Furwin doesn't have a strong nose, uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, it's not an aromatic varietal, it's perfect for the Topai region. And most importantly, Furwin is prone to noble rot, the Botrytis, Botrytis, and that's very, very important for making these dessert wines uh, that made Topai very famous over centuries. So if you're tasting it, it, um, it, um, it has these citrusy aromas. I think that is the most typical to Furmin. Grapefruit, kiwi, uh, green apple, and so on. I'm not sure, you know, gooseberry, whatever you guys taste. And um, it does have a bit of dryness, which um, is from the fact that it has good tannins, good dryness uh, from coming from the skin of, the, of the, this varietal. And uh, uh, when it ages, it starts to develop uh, walnut, nutty aromas. So I'm not sure what you get from all of this, but, uh, but uh, that's, that's, that's what, what I get <laughs> on, on my end. And um, yeah, so please enjoy it. I'm gonna have a sip myself. <clears throat> The um, Tokai has a, a unique bottle as well. I think I talked about that from other tasting. Uh, they, they use two bottles now. One of them is for the dessert wine, and the other one is, this one is for the, the dry wine. Uh, th this, was, this is the traditional bottle, the older bottle that we have been using for 100 plus years. And then this is, this is a blown up version of that. They are pretty cool uh, bottles, uh, both of them. They stand out. I think they are classy. So I'm, I'm very happy with those. And if you're ready, uh, we can move on, if you don't mind, to taste the old man's wine. Yes. I'll give you a minute to, to open it. And uh, until that, I will see if I got any messages.
So this wine that you are just about to pour uh, is coming from the Shomlo region. You can see Shomlo on this very uh, slide or on this very image. And uh, this is Shomlo. It's a tiny, tiny uh, uh, wine region. The smallest or the second smallest of Hungary. Uh, 600 hectares of vineyards are planted there. And uh, the volcanic hill stands north of Lake Balaton, so on the northwest side of the country, 432 meters high, in the middle of a sort of plain area. It, it really sticks out uh, almost like a, a star destroyer, uh, you know, taken from Star Wars. So it's, it's just there, sitting there, this huge uh, volcanic rock. And on all sides, it's a, only a few places uh, do this, but all, all around the, this volcanic hill, there, there are grapes uh, cultivated. Of course, Hungary is a cooler climate, northern region, so the southern slopes are the most precious. But on the northern and both the uh, east and west side, there, there are there are grapes grown. Uh, you can see the southern side of this uh, of the Shomlo hill, and actually the, the winery that uh, produced this Olas Riesling is uh, is right here, uh, somewhere in the middle right uh, part of the of the uh, of this uh, uh, picture, not all the way up, but somewhere in the middle of the of the hill, and. Um, I mean, just from the from the the uh, um, uh, shape of this of this hill, we can see that this is an extinct uh, volcano. Uh, we were talking about volcanoes in in Tokai. Uh, this is somewhat different because in Tokai, it's volcanic ash that uh, covered the region, but in this case, uh, this is the lava uh, that uh, covered the region. So. It's incredibly uh, a hard rock, uh, this black, dark gray, so-called basalt uh, rock covers this entire hill. That is the base uh, of, of, of this region. Uh, unlike in Eger or Tokai, where people take advantage of, advantage of the porous you know, rock that they can carve, here the cellars are tiny. They can dig into the, cellar, the, the hillside because it's so it's so hard so it's a very different idea and uh, this uh, this uh, basalt base rock is covered with uh, sand gravel and clay and a bunch of other soil types uh, but once the, uh, the grapes reach a certain uh, depth very soon actually they, they hit this this rock and yeah, there is no there is no easy way here. They have to uh, cut through the rock somehow with their roots. Uh, this region is also exciting because uh, uh, somehow during the communist times, this became a, a wine region of hobby winemakers. <clears throat> so even today, uh, there are thousands and thousands of families who have little you know a couple of rows of uh, uh, vineyards here and. That's very romantic, but uh, it's also one of the reasons why the region is had back a little bit with development. And uh, like this producer, Mr. Polonich, um, has 10 hectares of vineyards. He's one of the bigger players there already. So typically the average size is, or the, the size of the wineries here is very small and uh, it's mostly a white wine region. Uh, I have the most important grapes listed here. Olas Riesling, the one you are tasting right now, is very important. But Furmint and Ufark, uh, Tromini, Hashtavelu, beautiful Hungarian names, uh, and grapes uh, are also grown here. My personal favorite from Shomlo is the wine you're drinking. Olas Riesling, uh, just like Furmint, has a very neutral uh, uh, character. Uh, but it is much lower in acidity than Furmi. And since this uh, hill is already so volcanic, so rocky, it will produce, no matter what, 
very harsh, very strict, uh, sharp vines that need aging. So if you plant a, a, a varietal that is already acidic, like Urmint or Ufart, then the wine is, can be very astringent. And uh, it might be excellent in 10 years, but, but you, you do have to weigh that. Nevertheless, Olas Riesling doesn't have the acidity of Furmin, so I think it really suits this, um, this uh, terroir and, uh, and is drinkable much, much earlier than, than other ones. And I think it has a better balance than, than, than many of the other varietals that come here, from here. You know, there are obviously exceptions and it's not true for all of the labels and bottles, but that's my, that's my experience. And um, uh, there are some red grapes grown here as well, uh, but uh, I've been staying away from them. Uh, they, they, they tend to be a little bit, uh, from this, again, from this uh, volcanic uh, terroir, they tend to be a little bit uh, uh, harsh and, and uh, just straightforward. Um, it, it really is more of a better, better suited for, for white wine production. Uh, with, of course, a couple of nice Syrahs and Cabernet Francs as, you know, exceptions. But you really have to go out and look for, for those. And um, uh, the winemaker, Kolonichur, Kolonich, Mr. Kolonich, aged this, uh, the, this Olas Riesling in large 1,000 or 1,500 liter oak, Hungarian oak barrels, used oak, and uh, the grape spent, uh, or the juice wine spent over a year in the barrel and uh, then another uh, two years now in, in the bottle. So I think it had a nice uh, time to, or enough time to, to mature nicely. But you tell me what you think. Uh, Shomlo is not really for uh, novice uh, wine drinkers. Uh, many times when you open a bottle, it's not going to be that attractive. Uh, it will, you know, smell like wet rock, uh, earth, uh, mud, rhubarb, you know, uh, green, green flavors uh, or green uh, notes will come out. And then once you aerate the, the wine a little bit, then, then it will smoothen a, a little bit. It will become a little more smooth. Or also when you age it in the bottle for longer, it's a great wine to, to lay down and age. And then... Um, then that will change the game as well. So let's move on to the next line. Excuse me, I got a little carried away with my slides. And we can move on to our first thread, the Chokasul from the Bushai winery and from the, the Zala region. I can see some of you are enthusiastically pouring and following me. Thank you for that. Cheers. I guess you get that. One thing I forgot to mention about Shomlo is that that's the traditional Hungarian wedding night wine. So there is, there is a natural demand for that in, in Hungary. So Zala is an even more obscure region, even for Hungarians, than, than Shomlo. I'm sorry that I'm uh, you know, hammering you with all these obscure names and regions, uh, but that's what we set uh, for today. So Zala is in the southwestern part of the country. If you picture Hungary, uh, there is Budapest in the middle, then in the Midwest, there is Lake Balaton, and then this is way south of that, uh, very near the a triple border or, uh, you know, a quadruple border border of Hungary, Austria, Slovenia, and Croatia. One of the things that is really exciting about this region is that 
you drive for a few hours and then you're in a different country with different languages, different wines, winemaking culture. So anyway, this, this is a border wine uh, coming uh, from this borderland uh, in Southern Hungary, Southwestern Hungary. Uh, it's, um, the, the soil here is not volcanic. It's more just black forest soil uh, with a bit of clay and loess, sand. So not as exciting as many other of our regions uh, with limestone and, and rhyolic tough stone and stuff. The climate is pretty cool uh, because um, it's very near the, Aust the Alps in, in Austria. So we, we get a, a bunch of cool uh, you know, winds from that. And uh, that will show in the wines, uh, the, 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 the grape varieties. And, um, and here too, Olaf Riesling is very important and 75% of the grapes are, are, are white grapes. Uh, the one we're tasting is Choka Sölö. Choka is a big black bird that you can see in the, in the villages in the countryside quite a lot on, on fields and freshly plowed uh, 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 soil. Uh, I think in English it's crow, C-R-O-W, I'm not sure how it's spelled, crow, or crow. And uh, that, that's the name of, of that, that, that's what choka means. And sulu means grape. So crow, crow grape is, is the translation. And um, it's an ancient uh, variety that uh, used to be Hungary's uh, number one red in the medieval times. Then it was overtaken by the Kodarka grape uh, that was brought in by the Serbians after the Ottoman times. And uh, Kodarka was also forgotten and overtaken by Cake Frankosh, which I will talk about later today and also on our session on October 9th. So Chokasulu once was big, but it was forgotten and uh, it only survived in this wine and vine research institute in the city of Teach, where they, we have a couple of these research institutes, uh, uh, one in the Great Plain, one in Teach, one in Tokai, one in Bodachon. So these are like, you know, grape labs where they experiment with crossing different grapes and they also keep uh, a, a stock of all of the grapes that are grown in Hungary. And they collect them, they, they look for old varieties, and if they find something unique, you know, it, they, will, they will save a few uh, examples. And that's where Choka Sulu survived. And uh, in the early 2000s, a couple of winemakers were experimenting with old Hungarian varieties. And then two of them, including Dr. Bushai, uh, the the uh, ex owner of or the founder of this this winery uh, got very excited and they they planted uh, about one hectare of this 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 uh, wine and uh, even today they just make one barrel of it you can see on the photo it's a big barrel I think 1200 liters or so uh, but that's all they make uh, from from this wine every year. It is a sort of an acidic variety. It has a light purple color and a rose petal, uh, uh, violet kind of aromas, and you name it. It's, it's, you know, it's not one of these dark red, uh, heavy uh, uh, grapes or wines that uh, like a Cabernet, this is very, very different. Uh, again, once it used to be very common here, and it's totally not common anymore. Uh, it's an obscure grape from a from a very obscure region. So, I hope you like it, and not just the story. Um, I do like this this grape quite a bit. I think it it can be on it can it can serve a similar purpose as a lighter Pinot Noir. So you know, with pizza or you know lighter lighter dishes. Uh, this this can be a perfect match. And uh, if you can keep up the pace, then uh, 
we can move on to our to our wine number five, the the Bicavir, the Bull's Blood, and I hope you guys have this bottle. Eger also has uh, its own bottle now. It's sort of a a fatter Bordeaux bottle, fatter, shorter, or shorter body and a longer neck. This is, and, and it says Eger on the label. You can see it, you guys have it in your hands. So the traditional Eger blend, like Bull's Blood and the Chilla blend uh, come in this bottle. And I'm going to pour a glass for myself too. So before we go any further, I'll talk about the history of this blend a little bit. Um, so Bull's Blood is not a great variety. It's a, it's a style of wine. It's a fantasy name, a brand name, uh, let's say, that was invented uh, in uh, the late 1800s in the, the region of Eger. And uh, it's always a, a blend of different grape varieties. Uh, it's not a field blend, so they don't harvest these these uh, grapes together, but they rather they make the wines separately, age them separately, and then and then and then they blend the finished wines uh, when the time comes. There, are, just like with the Chillog blend, there are three different uh, uh, quality levels: classic, superior, and grand superior. Uh, what you guys are having is a superior. Uh, quality, so medium uh, level. Uh, these, these quality levels don't necessarily, you know, are not going to assure that you like the wine. Just because you buy, you know, something so-called grand superior, you might not like it. Maybe it's going to be too heavy for you. And maybe a classic level will actually suit your style, you know, the moment, the dish you're having uh, better than than, than you know, some of the more expensive ones. So uh, typically, the more it's more, the higher quality, you know, the more the higher the price. But it's not always connected, you know, with the let's say the enjoyment of, of that particular bottle. There has to be at least uh, four varieties in in the blend. Uh, Thirty to sixty-five percent of it has to be cake francoche. Cake francoche is Hungary's most common red grape. More than ten percent of our red production is cake francoche, and altogether there are twelve permitted grapes that can go in this bottle. But the grape with the highest proportion has to be cake francoche and other local uh, uh, red varieties, and uh, each of them, if you put a grape in it, it ha you have to put at least five percent. Uh, in it, and Turan, this uh, uh, Turan is a Hungarian grape that was um, crossed in the 20th century. They, it's a very dark, uh, fruity, uh, almost candy, candy-like uh, 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 grape that uh, they were trying to make a. You know, the Bicavir is a blend, and with the Turan grape, they wanted to create a grape that will have the same, make the same wine as a, as a nice Bicavir blend. But they failed. Uh, you, you can't uh, replicate or you can't, you know, have an easy way out of blending uh, just by creating a new grape. And uh, nevertheless, it, the grape is still around. It's called Turan. It's a very dark uh, heavy, fruity uh, wine with lots and lots of cherry flavors. So that can only be 10% of this blend. Uh, I'm not sure why, but they are trying to stay away from, from that uh, grape. And uh, the, the classic uh, level, so the, 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 the control for, for bull's blood starts in the vineyard. Uh, 
the, the higher the quality, the lower the yield in the vineyard. So that means that the grapes, uh, they, from, from one hectare of, of uh, vineyard, they will have to just harvest less grapes. So there will be a green harvest when they cut off some of the bunches for, for the higher quality uh, uh, wines. For the classic, there's a six month barrel aging and the alcohol content is also uh, set with a minimum 11.5. And the superior that you are having right now, uh, that uh, requires 12 months aging, you know, minimum 12% alcohol and a long uh, maceration. Uh, so a long uh, uh, skin contact uh, with the juice. So, so, you know, they press the grapes, they, they rag them in a, in, a, in a vat or a tank and they do not separate the pressed skin from the juice for 14 days uh, to make it very tasty, uh, add a lot of color to that wine and uh, depth and, and, and uh, structure um, with, with uh, having uh, so much uh, soaking because skin of the berry uh, just has a lot of um, uh, content and 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 uh, juice that is that is really uh, precious for for the wine. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, with the with the Grand Superior that we're not having now, uh, we do have one in the U.S. the the Hongach uh, from the Agrippicovia or from the Saint Andre Winery. Uh, that there, there is even lower yield. And uh, uh, then, then, then it is with this one. So the Aldash blend, Aldash means blessing in Hungarian, is coming from the St. Andrea winery. They were one of the, the first ones to really uh, put the Bikavir blend back on the map because during the communist times, Bikavir, Bull's blood became synonymous with cheap uh, bulk wine that was sold in the Soviet Union, it was sold in the Eastern Bloc, it was sold in the UK, uh, bottom shelf, it was sold in the US as a cheap, 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 you know, supermarket wine. So the, for many years in the, in the 1990s, winemakers in Eger would make some really nice blends, but they were afraid to put the name Bikavir on it because the reputation was so, uh, so uh, bad. And uh, Lurie's Gjord of St. Andrea had the courage and, you know, he, 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 he actually, he also, he had some wines in the early days when he didn't put Bikavir on it, but then, you know, they had to make a decision whether we're gonna forget about a, a name, a brand that is 150 year old, or whether we're going to reinvent it and, and, and re, re, re establish you know, the reputation. And thank God they kept the bull. The bull is, is alive and is in very good shape. And, uh, and after 30 years, uh, uh, we, we have some really, really nice uh, uh, bull's bloods again. And I think this Adash one, I'm, I'm pretty sure you're enjoying it too. I hope you are. So cheers, cheers to that. You know, uh, Cape Francoche has a very strong sour cherry, sour cherry pit aroma, also a bit of a, uh, earthiness and smokiness and that, that usually comes through even in the blends. But this blend has uh, a lot more. It has Syrah, Kodorka, Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot. So it is really a, it's a, there, there's a lot going on there. And I think um, the, the end result is very nice. It's a very lively, uh, fresh, fruity, chewy red wine um, that, it, you know, and it, and it makes you want to have another glass. So that's, that's, a, that's a good sign. And um, I will, I have to move on to the next tour destination, which is Tokai. 
we already tasted the dry formin from here. And now we're moving on to the sweet, sweet samorodni. Uh, if you're ready, let's see how we're doing on time. If you're ready, I will, I will start uh, introducing uh, the different Tokai styles. And uh, basically, if you want to really put it in simple terms, there are two styles. There's dry and sweet. But that's of course dumbing down the, the very complex uh, Tokai uh, portfolio. But anyway, there's dry Tokai and sweet Tokai. From the dry, you already had the dry food mint. That's a, that's a very typical uh, style uh, these days. And not only food mint, there are other grapes uh, grown there. You can make similar uh, style uh, dry tokois uh, from Hashtalalu and Muskotai. And many times they blend uh, these uh, to bring out different characters and different uh, emphasis on in, in these wines. There's dry Samorodni, which is uh, usually a blend and uh, I will talk about the Samorodni method in a, in a few minutes, but um, it's practically a dry uh, late harvest, uh, a dry barrel aged late harvest wine from uh, shriveled botrytized berries. And then from the sweet ones, there is a very, very, uh, or a much longer list. There is sweet Samorodni, I will introduce that. There is late harvest, in Hungarian it's called Késői Suret, uh, the difference between sweet samorodni and late harvest is that the samorodni is a traditional sweet wine, so there are regulations how you, you need to make it. And Keisho Yisurat is a new, sort of a newcomer, so there are no regulations. You don't need to barrel age it, you don't need to have botrytis in it, it just has to have a certain uh, sugar level. It has to be a sweet wine, harvested later in the fall. The, and then the top two categories is, are Asu and Essencia. I will talk about these. And uh, I also listed two minor categories, Fordítás and Máslás. Fordítás means turning over and Máslás means copy. Uh, these are minor categories that go back to the times when, when there was an, not enough, not enough Tokai wine produced and the demand was higher than the supply. So then they made a lot of those, but they don't really make those that much currently. Uh, if you look at this uh, photo, then you can see a nice uh, Tokai bunch totally ready to be harvested. If you cut the whole bunch that you see on the, on the photo, then, that, then you will be making the Samorodni wine, the wine you're having right now. That's a Samorodni wine made from whole bunches uh, like this. So how is it made? Sweet Samorodni. Usually it is a blend, although the one you're having is 100% Furmin, but that's sort of atypical. Usually it's a, it's a blend of, of different grapes. Uh, there's a minimum um, 45, 50 grams uh, per liter residual sugar that's required. It's totally natural coming from the grapes. In this case, the one you're having, I think it's three times that much. It's in the 140s. So it's a very, uh, very generous uh, summer of me. Uh, it's a whole bunch harvest. So like I showed you, they cut the whole bunch. Some of the berries are healthy and ripe. Some are overripe and then some are shriveled. So they, they, they press these bunches. Uh, the normal berries will have a, bunch, a lot of juice and the drier berries will have less and um, they will you know, add a lot of sweetness to, to, the, to the juice and once they press this, this is going to be ragged uh, to a barrel uh, where it's going to spend six, well now it's required by law to spend six months in barrel, but that's really not enough. It usually spends over a year in uh, Hungarian oak, but even more is, 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 can happen. So in simple terms, uh, Samorodni is late harvest, 
botrytized wine aged in barrel. And of course it has to come from Tokai. Only Tokai can use this, this term. And uh, it's always served in these uh, half a liter bottles. There's a dry version of uh, this. It's the same idea, whole bunch harvest, botrytis, barrel aging. But uh, sometimes either the sugar level is already lower or else fermentation just doesn't stop. And, um, and um, it, it ferments, instead of turning into a sweet wine, the Samorodni, the late harvest uh, wine, is going, to be, um, is going to go totally dry. And uh, typically winemakers don't fill up the barrel fully. So there is a, a more oxidation in this wine. And uh, there's also a bit of a floor. So the same kind of a yeast uh, film will develop on, on the top of the wine, like, like uh, it happens in, in Jerez. And um, it will be a little bit similar to a, to a sherry, to a, to a, to a wine uh, from, from Jerez, uh, with, but it's not a fortified wine and it has a lower alcohol level and less sharpness than, than, a, than, a, than a Jerez, than a sherry. And then the, the top wine, the top brand of, of Tokai is the Osu. Osu means shriveled berry. And it also means the, the wine made from these shriveled berries. So the harvest is not as simple for Asu as it was with Samorodni. It's a multi-step harvest. First, they make a base wine. And while that base wine is fermenting, uh, people go out in the vineyard and pick the Asu berries one by one. It's not, a, it's not a bunch picking, it's a berry picking, berry selection. And they collect a bunch of these botrytized uh, berries and throw them into the base wine. Uh, this way, there's a much higher extraction and a much higher uh, concentration of flavors than when you use the Samorodni method. And, uh, and uh, that's why there is higher sugar level, higher complexity uh, when, when you're trying an Osu. It usually has a low alcohol content and uh, the sugar level will be between 120 actually 90, 90 to 180 grams per liter. It's a very labor intensive wine with all the different harvests. It's, it, it, it's a very sort of expensive wine in general because it takes years of barrel aging and years of bottle aging before you know, it can be released. And um, the reward is that it's a, a wine that ages really well in the bottle and we're talking about uh, decades, maybe centuries. And uh, it's a very complex wine with high acidity, high tannins, high natural sugar level, uh, you know, rich, full body. Uh, it's a very deep wine, a very long wine, and uh, it has a lot of exotic flavors, citruses, wall um, or pruned, pruned apricot, fig, uh, dates, and so on and so on. I mean, many, many. And then sometimes surprisingly, like aromas of dill and, you know, whatnot. These are what the Osu berries look like. So this is uh, what people pick by hand, one by one. And they are not just raisins, these are attacked by the, what I described earlier, the noble rot, the botrytis fungus, which perforates the skin of the berries, so the juice disappears and the sugar level and all kinds of uh, concentration goes uh, way up. And then of course, uh, sweetness is part of the terroir and so are the cellars where both the dry and the sweet Tokai wines uh, are aged for years. Uh, time is definitely an ingredient of, in Tokai. 
and uh, today people don't take uh, their time that much in, anymore but I think uh, uh, I hope uh, uh, they will find a balance between you know cash flow and, and aging their wine to, to the right point uh, before they release it but aging is, is very important when it comes to Tokai and when it comes to some of the best uh, you know wines in the world aging is, is, is very important uh, and I haven't talked about Essencia. This is uh, the, probably the most expensive wine in the world, if we can call it wine. Uh, this is the natural drippings from the shriveled berries. So they put these shriveled berries in a, in a tank with a perforated bottom and whatever flows out naturally by its own weight uh, will be uh, ragged into a barrel a tiny 110 liter barrel. After a few years, they will put them in a container like this. And uh, they, they sell these by the bottle uh, in, in half, you know, three hundred and seventy five milliliter bottles. Or they also use it for topping up, uh, increasing the also the, the level of the, the sugar level of the also also wines in, in, in worse in bad vintages. So this is so almost like the, this is, you know, the, the gold bullions in, in a, in a top five winery uh, where people can reach uh, to if, if they need a bit of um, uh, uh, help with, with their also wine in, in, in worse uh, vintages. The alcohol level is very low to, to 4%. And uh, I would not, uh, you know, serve this with anything i would only serve it on its own and uh, usually it's served uh, by the spoonful of little crystal glasses and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty expensive one and um, just one little uh, sentence about the food pairing uh, tokai sweet wine osu and samorodni are are actually great food pairings I, I drink them as dessert for one thing, but I also really like drinking them as aperitif with uh, foie gras. We eat a lot of foie gras here, so that's, that's a natural pairing for it. It's also great with aged cheeses. And, uh, and actually you can experiment. It, it's going very well with really spicy Asian food, Indian, Thai food. Uh, I like, uh, it's very hard to pair Asian food with, uh, with uh, wines. And I have had some really nice experience with, uh, with uh, pairing uh, sweet Tokai wines with, with, with really hot Asian food. And uh, well, I hope you enjoyed uh, the time with me. This is where you can find us, uh, right here in Budapest. Or you can find us in the EU on tastehungary.eu. And you can find us in the U.S. on tastehungary.us. And um, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to stop the, sh the, the, uh, the screen sharing now. And uh, oh, I, I got a lot of messages. So let's. Oh, Mike and Emily. Hi. And um, one more question. Um, so has global warming affected the wine harvest time in Hungary? The short answer is yes. Uh, do they pick earlier than in the past? Yes, in the past 10 years, they have been picking earlier. Nevertheless, uh, in, you know, uh, nature is unpredictable uh, and this year uh, we are actually harvesting late uh, we had a very we had a very uh, uh, cold uh, spring then we had a normal hot summer Hungary has a, has a continental climate you know four very different uh, seasons but anyway we had a cold cold spring hot summer and uh, Usually, or at least lately, they've been starting harvest in mid-August. 
but this now was pushed back to early September, mid-September. So, you know, I mean, nature is unpredictable. Let's just accept that. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, but why, but, you know, I'm not a winemaker, but I do hear, they do say that they, still har they have been harvesting earlier, uh, lately. Um, the wine has opened up and is beautiful after opening. So another question, which wines, uh, that we are tasting today would benefit from bottle aging? Um, well, the, the sweet Tokai for sure, the Samarodni. I think the red, the, the Adash could, uh, could be very nice even in five years. Uh, maybe not 10, but, but five, I think easily. Um, the, the Chomlo, that, that could be a, a, a wine that ages well. Five to 10 years, I think. And I'm not sure which, which, um, which, for, so those of you who, you who have the Zafir for me, that could, that could age well. Uh, these three. Another question, how do you recognize uh, Hungarian oak? What smells or flavor do, flavors does it add to a wine? So I will try to answer. Uh, you know, there are the Hungarian oak is, is not as uh, subtle and not as, uh, let's say elegant as French oak. Uh, but also not as robust as American oak. It's somewhere in between. From American oak, you would get, you know, vanilla. I think from, from French oak, you would maybe get cocoa and, and stuff like that. So a little bit more perfumey flavors. And Hungarian oak is somewhere in between, but I think it's closer to uh, the American side. So it's a pretty strong oak, pretty, um, uh, I would say a little bit on the rustic side, even though that doesn't sound very good. Uh, I would say it's a little bit on the toasty, a little, it's, it's a pretty, uh, you have to be careful with it. You, you can easily over oak your wine with Hungarian. Uh, so yeah, it, it's a strong one. Some uh, winemakers use uh, French oak here because of this, because they don't want uh, that much uh, oak influence in, in their wine. Okay, how does Hungarian wine compare to Brunner Wettliner? That's a tough question. Uh, Brunner Wettliner is an Austrian varietal. We make it here as well. And um, maybe you were wondering if, uh, how does Furmin compare to Brunner Wettliner? Uh, that's a good question uh, because Brunner Wettliner is also a very versatile variety making some really great dry wines and also making some really great sweet wines. Mm, but uh, Furmint, I think, has much more aging potential, uh, much more barrel aging capacity or, or possibility. And, uh, well, I think it's just a much more exciting. I mean, I love Gruner, but Liner, but, but Furmint has so much more dimensions than, 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 than Groovy. And uh, that's it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will share my email address with you. In case you have any questions. What's my favorite Hungarian wine? One more uh, question came in. It's a very unfair question. I can't answer. <laughs> Furmint is my favorite Hungarian grain, that's for sure, no question. And um, I hope to see you, some of you or all of you on October 9th. And if not, then thank you so much for your attention. Bye Mike, bye Carolyn, Rita, everyone, Light. Uh, see you guys soon. See you, bye.